All right, this is Chris, I'm with Todd. We're down in the divot room and we are honored to have on Zoom for our first interview. We're gonna have Tim Tucker is with us today, everybody. <laughs> All right, so your Thanks professional caddy me. entrepreneur. Yeah, professional caddy entrepreneur and former golf pro himself, Tim Tucker. Tim, how you doing, man? I'm doing great. Thank you. Yeah, so we just want to start off. We want to kind of just hear just the three minute. Uh, well, I mean, if you want to keep it a little bit more than three minutes, that's totally fine, because I'm sure you could probably go on. But just maybe just the early years of uh, Tim Tucker. I don't know if you went by Timmy or not as a kid, but uh, just the early years of Tim Tucker and, and, and kind of how you got into golf. Yeah, um, I, I grew up in Amarillo, Texas, and actually just recently moved back here um, about seven months ago. I've always wanted to come back. You know, I lived out in Oregon for 20 years, but um, always wanted to come back home. Um, my dad passed two years ago, so that's a bummer. I wanted to be back, you know, to hang out with him. He retired and played a lot of golf, and so loved playing golf with him. But it was, you know, unfortunately, he passed. But uh, I'm back here, and I love it, but I grew up in Amarillo. And uh, I went in the military, went in the Air Force out of high school, and then got out of the military, went to work at the State Department in Washington, D.C. And uh, yeah, I had a top secret clearance with my job in the military, and so it was easy to do that. I was working there, just not really enjoying the job. So, you know, guys were starting to, I worked midnight shifts, so guys would play, you know, when we got off work. So it's really, you know, every morning, so we wouldn't go to sleep. And uh, so I just started playing golf and loved it. And, you know, hanging around golf courses, as you guys know, man, it's easy to fall into that business. And so I started working as an assistant. Um, I worked at a place in Virginia called uh, the Robert Trent Jones Golf Club. Beautiful place. I had the first two President's Cups. And then uh, moved out to Oregon and worked at Creekside Golf Club and then ended up uh, at Springfield Country Club, was the head pro there for four years, and then wanted to get out of the golf business, so I moved up to Bandon to Caddy, or moved down to Bandon to Caddy and just meet people, you know, because I'd been down there, and, you know, that clientele, as everybody knows, is, is you know, people from all over the world come there and play, and mostly success, successful people, so I just wanted to see what opportunities were out there, so I did that and I did get several job offers, but um, I fell in love with that lifestyle of, of caddying and playing and practicing. And so I got my amateur status back in 2005 because um, my goal was to play in the mid-am in 2007 at Abandon and qualified for that, played in that. And then just, man, just really got into golf and in, into the amateur side of it and loved playing. So used to play in everything in the Northwest and, you know, to always try the qualifiers, the USJ qualifiers. And I've played in three mid-ams. I played in one four ball, the first one. Actually, Bryson was in that four ball. He was playing with his college buddy, Austin Smotherman, which is on the web now, or excuse me, Corn Ferry now. Yeah. But uh, did you kick then, his ass? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Although my partner, Kyle Crawford, he's a caddy at Bandon. We played Olympic. On the ocean course, he shot five under on the front nine on his own ball. So wow. Wow. we ended up qualifying fourth, and then we lost to some guys from Phoenix. But uh, anyhow, so Caddy the Bannon, love and life, everything was great. And a friend of mine from Boise, he knew Tyler Aldridge, which was playing on the Corn Ferry Tour at the time. And one got his card on tour and was looking for a caddy and I ended up caddying for him. And, uh, he's an awesome dude. I wish he were still playing. He, he decided to give it up. Um, but, uh, he was an amazing player, really good guy. And, uh, anyway, I ended up caddying for, ended up leaving Tyler, ended up caddying for Bryson. And that's pretty much it to now. So when you, went from caddy and abandoned to Tyler. Did you take a pay cut? No, no. Tyler played actually played really well. He, you know, I think his best finish was 15th at, at Harbortown or Heritage, MCI Heritage. 
and uh which you know i made eight thousand bucks for that week i think it was so no tyler tyler played good we missed i think we missed four or five cuts you know in that four month period but he he played solid and uh but you know i just i really to be honest with you i didn't enjoy caddying that much um on tour wow. it's funny that you know i've been playing amateur golf i was i was a you know pga professional club pro um been around golf for you know 20 years and when i got out on tour i realized how little i knew about caddy so and it, it hits you pretty quick but you know you have to do a lot of work to catch up and, and not a lot of people there to help you really you know because they're busy doing their own thing right so yeah. you kind of learn on the fly but that first tournament with uh with, with tyler how were you were you nervous as he was or were you more nervous stand on that first tee box hoping you didn't mess up yeah i mean the nice thing is well you know so they pair caddies or pair players excuse me based on their you know world ranking and all that so it was you know we weren't playing with the best players in the world and and so that was it was a little easier there but yeah again the first one was valspar tough golf course um, I think he was eighth after the first day, played really well. I think he ended up finishing like 32nd or 33rd, something like that. But, um, you know, made the cut, which was great. And, uh, but yeah, it was, it was a little nerve wracking, but once you get into it, you know, it's just, just like anything, you know, you, it falls right into place. I'm, I'm more interested to hear about, <clears throat> excuse me. More interested to hear about this top secret clearance. Yeah. What the hell does that mean? What does that get you? <laughs> no, Come on, like, man. You know, I was Give us something. So I was I was in the military police. I, well, I was what they call it in the Air Force, security police. And I happened to go to a base in England um, called Upper Hayford. And they had nuclear weapons. So, you know, anytime you're around that, you had to have that clearance. And so, and then I went from there. I was there two years and then went to... Uh, NORAD in Colorado Springs, which I don't know if people know, it's the, it's the hole in the mountain that, you know, they run all the North America's, you know, air defense from there. Yeah. So anyway, I worked there. So you had to have a top secret clearance to work there as well. So since I had that, you know, I think it costs like $50,000 to get one of those. So then I had that for the state department, it was great. So I just moved right into that. Once you have it, do you keep it for life? No. <laughs> I, think it, <laughs> I think it expires like in 10 years. I'm not 100% sure on that, but I think it lasts 10 years. So, Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I, my job at the State Department, we would go through people's offices at night. So I'd work seven at night till seven in the morning. And we'd just go through people's desk and do the offices and we'd look for documents that were left out. And yeah, you'd find oh, wow. that doc yeah, wow. you'd find documents all the time that, you know, where they would half lock these safes, right? Because they, Jeez. every time they took a document, they didn't want to have to put in the, you know, so half lock it, they'd just turn it and you could, you just turn it back to zero, it, it'd pop open. But, um, so they'd forget to, to secure them. But yeah, I'd read these things and yeah, I didn't understand 99% of it. So, do you write them a citation? Do you, can you give them a ticket <laughs> yeah. for that? <laughs> yeah, we would leave it on the desk. To be honest, we'd do is we'd write a couple, and then we'd find a boardroom and go in there and watch, you know, Sports Center and take a nap and all that good stuff. Nice. You know, you were saying part of your deal was being a golf pro and and a caddy, but you also you were kind of an inventor, like an innovative guy. I remember you. I saw you down at the pro am at um, Bandon, and you were you had a bunch of putters. And tell me about some of your stuff that you. you you know that you kind of worked on yeah well so when i got down to bandon i was i don't know if people remember david adele he made adele putters and and the big part of that he'd worked for with henry griffiths but um we would fit putters based on how you see so every putter has an aiming characteristic to it and we'd find a putter that you could aim perfectly so just through different line angle or excuse me different uh head shapes hosel offset line combinations length all that so we would we'd build we'd find a putter we'd use a laser to find out where you aimed from six feet and most everybody would miss the hole by about six or six eight inches 
you know, right or left. And so we'd build them a part of it that it's like a rifle. It's like sighting in a rifle. You know, if you if I sight in a rifle for someone and give it to them, they, they may miss the target completely because we all see differently. So same with same with golf. So, you know, I did that for a while. Then I got into uh, the aim point green reading. And that was really great. I traveled all over the country doing that, teaching it, um, teaching it to students and then certifying instructors. And then a buddy of mine, he, he actually is out on tour now working. Uh, he's, he's an instructor. His name's Jason Goldsmith. He works with uh, Justin Rose and Jason Day. But he and I invented a golf product called True Aim. And it was an alignment decal that went on the top of your driver. And again, you know, if a driver, you know, driver has a mallet type or has a triangulation to the head, right? So it's typically right aiming. It has no offset. Again, another right aiming characteristic and then no lines, which is right aiming. And so I kind of came up with this. I was, I was in my, you know, I played all this tournament <laughs> golf and I could, I drew everything but the driver. And I was walking around in my front yard. I lost the pub links at Sand Pines. I finished second or third. And I'd pumped two balls. I lost two balls on nine. Made double both days. And I was just walking around in my driver going, why can I hit the driver? So, you know, I was putter fitting at the time. And I said, well, man, this thing, you know, I wonder if I aim this thing. It has all right aiming characteristics. So we had this laser that we'd shine at a golf ball. So I teed a golf ball up. I shined it at this laser. I put a mirror on the face of my driver. And I set up to it. And I was 10 yards away from the side of my house. And the spot I was aiming at, I was, you know, I had a, I put a piece of tape on the wall to aim there. And my son pulled the ball away, and I was nine feet right of my target at 10 yards. That Eight. looks square to me. So now, imagine where it was at 280, right? Yeah, especially on the ninth hole. And if you pump, if I pump two out, I don't make a double. Right? Yeah, I just made well, it, I just on. went Stun Kang and made it fucking 12. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So anyway, I'm like, well, lines make me aim left on putter. So I, I went to the auto parts store. I bought some auto pinstriping, and I stuck a silver line on my Titleist driver. And I went, I drove, I lived 30 minutes from Bandon. So I drove down there. I, uh, I couldn't wait, but I was patient. I, I went ahead and warmed up. And then I finally got to the driver. I teed it up and swung normal. And I hit a 30-yard hook. And I was like ecstatic. I was like, wow, this is amazing. I never could hit that shot. And I hit a massive hook. So I started just drawing the ball beautifully from then on. And so my buddy, again, Jason Goldsmith, the guy that helped me, or we invented this product, True Aim. We went out and, you know, we started coming up with these different decals and all this stuff and went out on tour, fit it. And I think we had over 60 players try it in competition. And, uh, but the problem was, and we sold about a hundred thousand dollars worth of them, but the problem was educating the public Anytime you're doing that, and also fitting one at a time, hard to make money, but yeah, that was a, that was another thing that I did. So that was kind of did, the three things I ended up doing but was I met Bryson through aim point because I taught him aim point when he was 15. Oh, nice. Do those align and stickers, they help with the snap hook. <laughs> Because that's what I've got to go right now. <laughs> Absolutely. Dude, every, it's, I'm telling you this. I promise you. I, have the, I don't know. I still don't have the data. It was on a computer I lost years ago. But every player that we worked with would, would decrease their dispersion with their driver by 50%. Not only that. That would, would help me a lot. Yeah. It would optimize all the launch conditions. You'd spin it less. You'd launch it higher. You'd actually swing it faster. It was amazing what it did. Wow. Wow. So I, I know that you're working on your own golf game now that you got some free time. I mean, I know you got the business starting up, but what's your handicap right now? How many, how many pops do I get if I go out and play with Tim Tucker? I'm a 10. Yes, I am a, I'm really struggling. So I'm a, a I'm a one point like one or something like that. I don't know. Wow. Did you just say you're struggling? <laughs> struggling. Well, I mean, I used one. to be like, so I never posted my scores, but based on my tournament rounds, I was like a plus 3.2 or something when I was really playing well in, in tournament play. So it really traveled, you know, that was just any, every course you played. So I never put in my local score 
you know, and I was playing abandoned too, you know, so I just, yeah, I was a legit plus three, which is, you know, good amateur, not great. I wasn't, you know, I go to the mid am and get smoked because those guys are really, really good. So, um, yeah, but that's a, so, that's a plus, that's a plus three when you're just posting tournament scores. That sounds amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I was, a, I was a decent amateur player in the Northwest, you know? So that was good. Yeah. It was fun. I loved it. But I, you know, I was on a golf course every day. I was hitting balls every day, putting for an hour a day. I loved it. You know, I just got really got into it. What about, are you playing any pro-ams down there in uh, Amarillo? No, I'm not. I just, uh, no, I, I haven't. All I've been trying to do is practice a little bit and get back into golf. But so, you, you know, you, trying to get my life back together, so to speak. Yeah, I bet it's a big change not traveling every week. Yeah, it's great. I mean, that's probably the worst part of, of being out there. Is tra- you know, you're, you're on the road 26 to 30 weeks, you know, and it's it gets tough. So you, you said you played in uh, the Mid-Am at Stand Pines. Where else have you played in the Mid-Am? I know you, oh, no, you I played in the, the Mid-Am at Bandon. I played in the Mid-Am at Atlantic Golf Club in Long Island. Oh. And then I played in the Mid-Am at Birmingham Country Club. And then the Four Ball at Olympic Club. Nice. Who would you say had an impact on your golf career? Man, man, a lot of people really, but you know, I mean, my dad got me started playing, um, you know, Dave Adele with his technology, with the putters and the aim really, you know, made me understand putting and how, why we're bad at putting. And then obviously green reading aim point was phenomenal that, you know, so all these little things really helped me, you know, understand golf a little better and, and, you know, the, a, a friend of the show, Joe Pisha, he was telling me a time where you guys were at a tournament and he was fucking playing terrible. And he said you came out on the back nine and helped him read putts. And he said he made like six birdies. Uh, that, that, that's the thing that I'm worried about, Brycey, is not having you to read putts. And I know you said before he can read putts, he knows aim point, but man, I've heard you're a phenomenal green reader. No, I mean, you know, Bryson's not going to struggle with that. He knows all this stuff. Like, you know, we, I taught him when he was 15. We worked on it, you know, for years. And then, you know, being on tour, we just developed, you know, always constantly working on the green reading. It is a skill, you know, it sounds difficult when you first do it, but it's like anything else. It's a skill that you have to practice and maintain. Otherwise, you know, it, it can go away or you can, you know not be as good at it but you know the the tour has contour maps and i mean they're super yeah. detailed so green reading on tour is really easy if you know where you are on the on that contour map so yeah he's the green maps are going away green reader. yeah how do you think that's going to affect them with the green green reading uh, books going away yeah it's just going to make well you make know, for a he, long Tuesday and Wednesday. His situation is so good. You know, he he's a special kind of person, man, a special athlete. He's getting – his intuition is so good, you know what I mean? And he – if he made more putts, he all his putts he makes from 15 feet. In, and he's probably the best putter in the world inside 10 feet. But, um, you know, 13, 13 feet and in, he's, he makes them all the time. It's outside that he doesn't. And – it's so funny. I, we always talk about it. You know, he works really hard on his speed control. He's a phenomenal green reader. And we say it all the time. It's like, you know, most players aren't reading the green with a system. So they don't know the exact read. They don't work on their speed control as precise as he does. So, and, and the, most of the tour players aim their putter or start their putts online. That's a fact. But two of the three are, are typically not per, as precise as Bryson. And that's why I say that he misses putts because his precision is so good, right? That if he gets an inconsistency mm-hmm. in the green or, you know, it, the likelihood of missing it is greater than a guy that's off. That putt could be online. 
So he hits a lot of putts that look like they're going in and just always seem to tail off at the end or something. But well, you know, his his putty that his putty at Wingfoot was was insane. I mean, the only dude under par. Yeah, I mean, he's his putting typically, you know, depending, you know, the only place he struggles is, is slow, slow, bumpy greens. Typically, when the greens are really good, he's phenomenal. So he, he probably wouldn't do very well at Heron Lakes, is what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I don't know, man. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I think that the Northwest has the best golf in the country. Everybody always tells me, oh, man, Long Island, New York. I'm like, no. I mean, Oregon has three distinctly different climates, right? You have the coastal range, you have the valley, you have the, the high desert. I, I think the golf in Oregon, I'd put it up against any place in the on the plane. I love the golf. Yes, right there. And yeah. In phenomenal shape. So, I, and, and on a side note, when I built, I built Augusta up to be the most pristine golf course in the world. I'll bet I've played five golf courses in Oregon in better condition. Wow. Wow. That's what? That's insane. You just see it on That's, TV. Okay. Just... Okay. So you just said that. That's amazing. I can't, I mean, I, I pictured, so I've always said, I don't know if I want to go to the masters because I feel it's going to ruin me. Right. So you, you hear about John Daly setting up his RV at Hooters right up the street. I'm like, there's a Hooters up the street. This is heaven. Yeah. Although I guess they might have Hooters in heaven too. I'm not really sure. But <laughs> so, so you just said, so, so you just said you would, there's five golf courses in Oregon that you would put up against Augusta National. Which five are they? Well, right off the top of my head, when Pronghorn opened in Central Oregon, when it first opened, we played the PNGA Cup there. And I mean, that golf course was the nicest condition golf course I'd ever been on in my life. Hands down. It was immaculate. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the greens in Oregon, I think, are phenomenal in season, right? Uh, yes. So I can't, it'd be tough to name a, you know, you're going to think I'm crazy. I played uh, Langdon Farms one day. And I mean, it was immaculate. I played Trophy Lakes when it opened up in Washington. Insane how good it was. You know, so I've played some, you know, we've been everywhere. You know, and, and the greens at Augusta do, do not roll 13 or 15. We read them with our, we read them with 11, <clears throat> 11 stem. If you had wow. those greens faster than that, they would be unputtable because of the undulation. You know, the sixth green, you wouldn't be able to keep a ball on the sixth hole. It would be impossible. So, you know, you take that with a grain of salt. The fastest greens that we've ever played on tour with when I was with Bryson was Muirfield Village in at the memorial, and they were they were twelves. Wow, that they the memorial, yeah, they always look like they're hard as hell and just look slick. And you just see like number eighteen looks like a bitch if you're above the hole. I can't yeah. believe that you just compared Langdon to Augusta National. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, don't get me wrong, condition wise. Uh, yeah, yeah, I get it. I get it. Hey, we, but we I'm just, not kidding. We, I've played these courses. I'm always a stickler for condition. I love yeah. great condition golf courses. And I'm telling you, I've seen, you guys know, when you play these golf courses, I mean, there's the Pacific Northwest, that's where they grow grass. You know? Yep. It's, it's true. All kinds of grass. My buddy works at yeah, exactly. My buddy Jimmy Myers is this is the superintendent at Columbia Edgewater. Go up there. That place is immaculate. Yeah, but now that they just pulled the Cambia Classic out of Columbia Edgewater because it looks like Thunderdome down there because of the homeless people hanging out, then gosh, I think I think we got uh, I think I, I'm really excited though to see what it's gonna look like on TV from uh, they're going to have it at Oregon Golf Club this year, and I'm really excited. I actually want to try to get a caddy job to, to caddy up there because it's a hell of a walk. So, speaking of caddies, yeah, Oregon Golf Club is awesome. Yeah, speaking of caddies, uh, me and Chris are playing in the club championship. I know it's kind of late notice, but I know you're retired. You, it's at Heron Lakes. I don't know. <laughs> you got time, Tim? You know, I'm a little busy, but you know, you have okay. I mean. Days. 
if you don't ask yeah. it's, it, it, well it's, it's just this weekend i don't know if you're gonna be able to yeah. make it up here so you can get your todd on sunday because i don't think i'll be in tension on sunday so all right you know what well, let's get into some bryson stuff i want to preface this with talking about my feelings about bryson just as a golf fan and and todd can chime in here too to kind of give his so bryson was never really on my radar as a golf and then and then he kind of came in right and he kind of started stealing spotlight a little bit and i was kind of like ah, who is this guy he's kind of a little annoying he's kind of got some quirkiness to him and then he started you know he put on the weight he's just all about all about distance it seemed like right and clearly there's more to the game and clearly he's proven that but he is i mean his nickname's the scientist it's it is what he is and and to me i'm more of a natural golfer natural field golfer so the science behind stuff just goes out way over my head but i gotta tell you tim at the arnold palmer invitational when he was trying to drive that green that par five i fell in love with the kid that reaction when he pumped his fist yes yes i mean that was to me i was like that's what a 10 year old kid looks like it's almost like that moment i was like that guy just probably fell in love with golf all over again with that one shot and i gotta tell you i'm a fan i'm a fan yeah he's quirky he's got but you know what he's a hell of a golfer he's a great golfer and so i want to get into some bryson stuff todd do you want to talk about maybe your kind of take on bryson before yeah just, I, just so we can preface this so we <laughs> i I've, I've, i'm a fan and i call him brycey because you know I'm, I'm like folksy like tiger he calls you know, people stevie and brooksy <laughs> and rosie so i call him brycey um I'm, I'm a fan i just i just like why the fuck does he keep saying the things he says and it's just distracts from stuff yeah so so let, let's get into this and we'll we'll have some questions that might be able to answer some of these kind of feelings we have but how, how, how'd you score bryce's peg i know it was back in 2016 right right so what happened my i was Again, I'm from Amarillo, and my dad lived here in Amarillo, Texas. We were down at the Byron Nelson. I was caddying for uh, Tyler Aldridge. And, you know, just things weren't going great. And I was kind of not into it, you know. I just, you know, we missed the cut, and I was like, you know what, Tyler, this isn't work. I appreciate the opportunity. i just not into this, right? And, and I was planning on coming back to – to Amarillo with my dad. He we he drove down, so I just drove back with him. It's a six hour drive. And I was like, I'm gonna play golf with my dad for a week, go back to Bandon and, and Caddy. And so I get halfway home. Well, Bryson or halfway to Amarillo, so three hours into the drive. And Bryson's coach, Mike Shy, called me and said, Hey, Bryson let his caddy go. Would you consider caddy for my colonial? And I said, well, you know, I'm not sure. He said, well, we're still trying to decide on what we want to do. He goes, I'll call you as soon as we know. And then I got to Amarillo and I was sitting at a bar with my dad having a beer. And I get a call from Bryson. And he asked me to caddy for him at Colonial, see how things go. So I got back on the, I stayed until the morning, flew back up that early morning on a Sunday and, you know, walked the golf course. Uh, met up with Bryson on Monday, and you know the, the that was that we missed the cut, but um, you know he played better, and we we you know I helped him with his green reading as far as understanding. When I say help him with his green reading, understanding his process, and you know and helping him with that. But uh, you know that's kind of how it happened. It was kind of a fluke. I I ran into Tyler on Monday. He was playing at Colonial as well, and I felt horrible because it looked like I quit him to go work for Bryson, and that was 100% not the case. I was really ready just to go play golf with my dad and then head back to Bandit. So, yeah, that's an opportunity. It's like, wow, this kid's going to be good. I know Tyler's good. It's, we don't think Tyler, you know, it's a different animal like given that opportunity and i get it and was it a bit of a were you having a midlife crisis like fuck i'm i'm done caddying i'm going back to bandon 
did it feel like a, you were having a crisis there or were you kind of happy with that decision? No, I was fine with it because, you know, again, I love, I love band and dunes. You know, I love that kind of golf. I, I, oh, yeah. I loved being there. I had, you know, the cool thing is there's 300 caddies out there, 330 now, and there's always a game and a lot of good players and you, know, you have banding crossings down south that we could play at any time, you know, gave us great deals there. And then we could play at band at any time there was a three hole gap. So we always played, you know, in the afternoon there. And, you know, 64 acre practice center, just unlimited balls to hit. I loved the lifestyle. I truly did. Yeah. So how, how did you negotiate your contract with uh, Bryson initially? Was it kind of you, you went and caddied for him at Colonial to kind of see how things happen? You kind of got kind of agreed on on a, on how much you, you were going to charge him for the week. And then did you, <laughs> then, then did you just kind like of, that. it doesn't? Okay. So, no. so talk, talk, just, you don't have to get into details about how much you were paid and stuff, but just talk to us about maybe, maybe what it's like to kind of negotiate a contract with a golfer. Well, I think, you know, when you're a new caddy, I think you take what you get, right? And I didn't, I never asked Bryson. Actually, uh, we were sitting down, I think, Wednesday night at Memorial before you even talked about pay. You know, I I just went into it and said, yeah, I'll work for you. And, you know, that's what it was. But, um, yeah, all, you know, if you're a, probably a, a seasoned caddy like, like a Stevie Williams or, you know, there's so many, you know, Jimmy Johnson that works for JT and, you know, these guys, I'm sure that they probably go, Hey, this is, I'm sure there's a little bit of a negotiation there, but you know, the player is the player and they set the, they set the tone for what they're going to pay. I got, I got to tell you, Tim, you just mentioned Stevie Williams and Jimmy Johnson, but I got to tell you, Tim Tucker's in that same conversation. Absolutely. It's you look, there's, it was like, could you name, any caddies if there's fluff yeah there's jimmy johnson stevie williams we, t- we tell them, we tell people that we're going to interview tim tucker they're like bryson's caddy yeah i mean you're, you're there man yeah. i mean people are people are yeah. going to be calling you up i'm sure you've probably gotten several phone calls from golfers well, already I've had some calls already but you know and I'm, not, I'm not ruling it out i'm just you know right now i'm not i'm not down but you know you never know. We'll see how my business it's, does. <laughs> it's a, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we'll get to your business here in a little bit, but, uh, um, so I, I, we, I want to hear the real story because there's a story out there that you pretty much quit on Bryson in 2017 and you went back to Bandon and then Bryson called you back up and, and got you back out there. Can you clarify that for maybe our listeners and for us just for that matter uh, what happened in 2017? You know, Bryson was, we were just in a bad, you know, Bryson is really misunderstood, right? I, and he, he would tell, if, if he were on this show, he would tell you right now, I don't, I'm not that talented. And so I have to outwork everybody else. He truly believes that. Now, I, I, I know that's not true, but that's his mentality. And that's what he believes. You know, um, there are a lot of players, you know, I have a buddy down in Florida, I played a lot of golf with. He never practices. He just plays every day, and he's phenomenal. Yeah, if so. I did that and didn't practice, I would get worse every day. And uh, but so Bryson really feels like he needs to. Um, but you know, we were just in a bad place. Ended up, you know, he got frustrated. I was frustrated. It was after the hope, missed the cut after. I mean, he was he was like four or five inside the cut line and on the back nine just you know, played, played poorly and got angry. And so we split up and ended up going back to Bandon. And I was just, you know, again, I love Bandon. So I was like, whatever, you know, it's fine. I was a little like, you know, embarrassed or disappointed that that, that happened. But, um, you know, he went on a bad streak of playing, unfortunately. He, I think he missed 13 of 16 cuts. And so anyway, called me back and, uh, we worked out a deal and I went out and started caddying for him again. Was it, was that deal? Like, I know the first time at Memorial, he told you how things were going to be. Did you say the second time, okay, here's how things are going to be. <laughs> Did you do that? No, not, I mean, no, not really. A little bit? No, I mean, you know what? We just made, it's like, listen, 
you know, these are the things we didn't like about each other, you know, at that time, you know, or how you, how I do stuff, how he did stuff. And we just said, look, we're going to, we're going to work as a team and we're going to put all, we're going to be nicer to each other and put all this stuff aside, you know, That's we're going to be professionals because he like was learning how to be a player and I was learning how to be a caddy. And so yeah, let's like, let's Fair figure enough. it out and let's be productive. Let's, let's build each other up. Right. And, and be a team. Yeah, that's awesome. It's it's good to hear uh, that story because I think there's might be some misconceptions and, and that might kind of lead to maybe some of Bryson's kind of, you know, reputation maybe, you know, and I think it helped that you came back um, because I think that spoke a lot, uh, spoke volumes to, to maybe your guys' relationship, but uh yeah, I think that's uh, really important to remember um, that, you know, we all work with people that we might not necessarily get along with, but you know what, if you can come together and say, hey, here's the deal. I mean, you've known him since he was 15. So clearly, clearly there's a relationship and uh, clearly there's going to be some some issues there at times. And uh, yeah, so, sound, sounds, uh, sounds like you guys are just able to have those difficult conversations, and- which, which might be difficult times i don't know shit from shinola but i have a feeling somebody's going to give you a phone call next year and say what's it going to take to get you to come back one more time yeah and that's just me my opinion i think so too uh no (laughs) (laughs) all right all right tim so what's your favorite course to caddy at Maybe give us give us three of your favorite courses and then three of your favorite tournaments because I think there's probably a little bit of a difference, right? So some tournaments might have some really kick out snacks for <laughs> caddies, maybe some good accommodations. I've heard Augusta is great for caddies, uh, and you know take COVID out of it because I know COVID was a big plus for caddies. You guys got to park close. You guys got a lot more kind of you got to be, maybe experience what it's like to be a little bit more of a player. And uh, but give us pre-COVID top five courses to cat or top three cat courses to caddy top three tournaments. Okay, well, let's see. To caddy at would be, I mean, the U.S. Open. It doesn't matter where it is. That's just for some reason, man. It's just an amazing. And this is whether he'd won or not. I just always enjoyed the U.S. Open. You know, you go into these these golf courses that are off the charts, you get to see them, you know, not everybody's played them. So it's um, not all the players have played them. So, you know, you, you feel like you have a level playing field, right? So I love the U S open um, all the majors for that matter, going over to Europe playing in the open championship is amazing. And I would put Carnoustie as one of my favorite courses I've ever played. Uh, caddied on um and then a third one would be bay hill Mm. bay hill does not like i played i was fortunate enough to play there right in front of arnold palmer and i didn't play with arnold palmer but i played right in front of him with a buddy of mine from uh the northwest and we kind of played the hole and then we kind of watched them hit approach shots all the way around but i didn't think that golf course was that difficult until i started caddying in the tournament and they set that course up so difficult and i think the most ballsy shot a tour pro has to hit is that six on the sixth hole the approach shot now not from where bryson was hitting it because he was hitting lob wedge and and (laughs) gap wedge but typically you're hitting in an you know, a 240, 260 yard shot. And it's gnarly. It is not easy. Um, but, and then my favorite tournament of the year, hands down was always Hilton Head, MCI Heritage. And it's after a major. So it's after Augusta. I have family there. Uh, the course is an easy walk. It's a fun tournament. The course is so cool. The island's amazing. So that would probably be my that's the one I look forward to. And actually this year we withdrew, Bryson withdrew and I went anyway. <laughs> nice. Did, did you ever get invited to Davis Love's party? 
At Hilton Head, no. Yeah. I, uh, <clears throat> I hear this constantly from professional uh, caddies as well about Hilton Head. Hands down, I would say across the board is what people say is their favorite tournament. So go, go into it a little bit. Why, why is that? I mean, just you, you said an easy walk. That, that's to me, there's got to be a lot more to it. I mean, do they have the best trail mix? I mean, what, yeah. <laughs> what, what, makes, what makes Hilton Head the best tournament well, to caddy in? You know, for one, so Bryson has finished fourth, third, fifth, and eighth at that tournament. So wow. that's always good money week for one. It's a yeah. good money week. You know the course really well. Uh, I have my family, my brother-in-law's younger brother lives just inside the gates of Sea Pines. So, you know, Bryson comes over every night for dinner. I have buddies that come in for that tournament. We play cornhole all night, drink beer, have a blast. Bryson comes over, eats. He's relaxed. He's comfortable. Um, my brother-in-law, he comes down. So, you know, just the family is, is great. So it's really not like it's a tough week for us. Then the weather's always great. That's, too, that's awesome. That, that's great. It, it, it reminds me of every pro-am that I go out of town to, whether it's the fall tour or band and dunes, those little pro-ams where you go and rent a house is always the best weekend of your life because you're just hanging out. You're playing some golf during the day and then barbecuing, drinking beers and hanging with your buddies and don't have a care in the world. Yeah, no doubt. That's, I, how, that's how Hilton Head I heard this awesome. I I heard a story, uh, I guess it was last year, because Hilton Head was one of the first tournaments back after COVID, right? Am I, am I correct on that? The first, it was one of, yes, the first was Colonial. Yeah. So uh, I heard a story for uh, Scott Sajnak, uh Jason Duffner's caddy. I don't know if he's still cutting for him. I'm pretty sure he is. But I heard a story from him on a podcast about how they came up over the bridge into Hilton Head and it was like COVID didn't exist. <laughs> Duffner looked at him and said, welcome to COVID Island. <laughs> Is that about as accurate as it was when you went there last year? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was shut down. But again, you know, we we cooked every night that week. So, I mean, we we're at the golf course and then back to, to my, my brother-in-law Kevin's house and just having fun. So, um, yeah. you know, COVID was really, you, you know, interesting. The nice thing is, is we didn't, you know, you don't have to caddy in the pro am, you know, because they didn't have any. So we had an extra day of pro, oh. which was awesome. And, you know, then no fans heckling my golfer, you know, they, they, the fans get pretty tough on Bryson. And, and some of it's deserved, but, you know, most of it's just, you know, people, I, I try and tell Bryson, I'm like 95% of the people out here are in love with you and 5% are heckling you. Let's focus on the 95%, man. But it's well, let's get into that. When someone let's, criticizes let's, you, it's really difficult yeah. to get past it. Well, I mean, as a caddy, at least, you know, from my take, it seems like maybe a little bit of a bodyguard, a little bit of security for your golfer, right? Uh, you know, if some random weird dude comes up and grabs your driver out of your golf bag and in Ireland, yeah. you you probably should maybe take the guy down. I'm not really sure what happened there. <laughs> I'm not yeah, sure how you would react. I know I would probably go up and confront the guy, but it just seemed really weird. So let's get into a little bit of this Brooksy Bryson kind of issue because there's clearly there's clearly is a few. And I've said on this podcast several times, it is great for golf. It is great for golf, and you might completely disagree because it might be total distraction on the course. I hope it's not, but if golf was a reality show, you need you need this kind of stuff. And if you want to increase your viewership, you're going to need this kind of stuff. So, so what was really go, what's really going on between Brooks and Bryson? Man, to be honest, so I have zero social media, right? And I'm like, I'm always out of it on all this stuff. But I did sit down with. Uh, Brooks's caddy, Ricky, and we talked, and he's just like, Brooks has nothing against Bryson. Bryson really has nothing against Brooks. I know this is not what people want to hear, but um, 
they just kind of messed around with each other. That's all. That's to be honest. So it was. It's it's I mean. it's like one of those things. I was early on. I was wondering if they were both trying to elevate their player impact program. You know, with their social media, like did they go in cahoots? Not to my knowledge, no. But I do think it's you know some of the uh, stuff is. You know how it is what it is, man. It's just, it's funny. Some of it is, some of it's annoying. But, you know, I get sick of the people calling Bryce and Brooksy. That, that, that annoys me, you know, because it's like, especially when it happens, you know, these guys are out there grinding like everybody else, man, that has a job. And it's like, no one's coming into your office heckling you, you know, people forget that. But, you know, it, it, it can be annoying hearing it all the time, but uh, you know what? That's why they get paid the big dollars, right? Did you uh, did you ever kind of help coach and counsel uh, Bryson on on how to do handle some of that stuff, or he just seemed like he had a handle on it and it wasn't that big of a deal? As far as the, the Brooks stuff? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's his deal, you know? I, I don't get into it. None of my business. I'm a caddy, you know, I stay out of it. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> or just one more thing about this Brooks and Bryson thing. And I, I, I only, again, I, I kind of find it good for golf. I think it's just, it, it, it kind of gets people interacting about it. People that don't even know golf well, they actually know about this. So I don't know if you ever saw it, but there was a little clip on, on the internet, on Twitter, of when Bryson leaps up behind Brooksy during the U.S. Open, uh, during Brooks's uh, interview. Kind of like the same where he walked behind. There's a couple of little clips out there where he walked behind and Brooks kind of rolls his eyes. So when he's walking behind Brooks during an interview, Bryson kind of leaps. And you're, you're walking right behind him. What are you thinking? Are you just like, what the hell did you just jump for? Do you even remember that? I don't remember that. I do know that the at the PGA Championship, that clip, what had happened, so that when you walked off the range, you'd go over this uh, grandstand, right? They had a little bridge. You'd walk over, you'd come down, and then you'd come around this white tent, media tent. Well, there on the cart path is where they were interviewing players, and so you wouldn't even see the player until you were on him or past him, right? And what Bryson was doing. Thank you. Not make there, putt. My putting is horrible. I couldn't right. make a putt or he was talking about his speed, right? Getting it to the hole or something like that. And he was talking, it wasn't me behind him. It was his agent, Brett Falkoff. And it just happened to turn out by chance that Brooks was talking about putting and I think Bryson was saying I can't get it to the hole but it sounded like he said just get it to the hole or something like that totally random and Bryson never looked or and that Bryson never saw him so that was just a that was just a freak thing that happened it just happened so it was a huge deal a perfect train wreck it was a perfect train wreck and it was there was nothing on Bryson's part I'll promise you I'll tell you that right now to instigate anything in that matter. So, you know, it, that was just a weird circumstance, you know? And, uh, yeah, it's, anyway. it sounds like this whole saga is more like Brooksy just has an issue with Bryson kind of, but Bryson just kind of doesn't really give a shit. No, no, I don't, I mean, I don't know. I don't really, we've played with Brooks yeah. a couple times. He's always been a, super nice to me. His caddy, Ricky is an awesome dude, stud guy. And, you know what? There's look. They're these guys are going to play on the Ryder Cup. I tell you what, those two oh, yeah. would be phenomenal. They'll beat anybody. But um, but you know, it's, I don't think it's as big. You know, the media likes to hype this stuff too. So don't don't forget that. You know, they're instigating this as yeah, well. Yeah, I, I I think it would be either yeah, Bryson and Brooks. You would. You know what? Just throw them in the cage together and throw them out there and see what happens. Because Br Bryson has he hasn't been good in the Ryder and President's Cup, 
And all of a sudden, if he had a different distraction of being, you know, doing poorly in those events with all of a sudden, you know, you got Brooks, who knows? I mean, if there was, if there was a GoFundMe account for uh, paying to have Brooks and Bryson play in the same Ryder Cup group together, I'd at least put a hundred bucks in there. That's what I could afford. But yeah. I, I want to see it. I want to see Brooks and Bryson paired together in the Ryder Cup. <laughs> yeah. I have, I have a feeling you're going to see Bryson and Patrick Reed playing in the Ryder Cup. It, yeah. Those two guys would kill it. Brooks is short, excuse me, Patrick Reed's short game and Bryson's distance. I mean, dude, they'd crush it. Patrick Reed is such yeah. a game. Dude. He is such a stud guy. I'm telling, I know people don't like Patrick Reed. But he is a, he's an amazing guy. He really is. I don't know if you've ever listened to our podcast, Tim, but we end it with everyone have a great week except for Patrick Reed. <laughs> <laughs> That's how much of a fan I am of Patrick Reed. He's just a yeah. dog. I know, hey, look, he's had his issue. I can't go in. I don't understand why that stuff's happened. You know, Patrick Reed is such a good player. He does not need to ever cheat. So, you know, but he is an amazing guy. I know his his brother-in-law um, really well. We've spent a lot of time with those guys, and Patrick's never been anything but a, a great guy to me and to Bryson. That's that's really good to hear, and I know our fans out there are going to be really disappointed for me to kind of say that it's good, good to hear. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, he's still kind of a ding-dong. But, uh, you know, I've always said, you know, he's a great golfer. Why, why, why does this, I mean, again, like you just said, he, he, he doesn't need, need that. Uh, okay. Hey, do, do you need a, do you need a break? Do you need to go get a brewski or anything, Tim? No, no, I'm on a 30 day, no alcohol kick and I hate it. I'm on day three. Oh, oh geez. I'm, and, three. and you see us sucking suds. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, my, I deserve it. Do you, uh, do you drink protein shakes? Um, I, I have been, yes, I've been, you know, I lost about 40 pounds and yeah, you know, yeah. I, I, I noticed that you had when, when we see you out there, I noticed you lost some weight. Yeah. So I'm trying to lose another 15 and I think I'd be really happy. So, you know, I've, it's funny, you know, you travel all these weeks, right? You'll be gone three weeks home for a week and then back out. And so it's like, I come home, I want to play golf and drink beer all day every day and try and cram you know the time I missed into that week and I, and I do it and you know now that I'm not working every week you know on the road I need to be like a normal citizen and just have a couple of beers here and there you know yeah. so that's what I'm trying to do nice can you just do me a favor and not lose any weight in those calves of yours yeah Things are amazing. Yeah, they're not going anywhere. <laughs> good, good. Because you know, there's always this. Phil Mickelson's always talking about his calves. I'm like, man, you guys need to check out Tim Tucker. He's got the calves better than Phil. But that's just my yeah, own. We're opinion. around Phil. All right. We're around Phil a lot, and he is a he's so he's a cool dude. I think, but you know, he's never really commented on my calves, and I don't know why. <laughs> Oh man, we need to start this. Yeah, this might this might just kickstart it here. This is going to get the viewership of the divot room up, and this is going to get the, the just the talk Tim Tucker and calves. calves. Hey, hey, speaking of Phil, at uh, God was was that the rocket when he pulled Bryson's eight iron out of the bag? Did did he bend it? It yeah. looked like it was bent. Wow. Yeah, well, it was that was all staged for the match, right? He had put the club in there mm. and we, you know, we, it was all like set up, but if people really paid attention, they'd know that Bryce and all his clubs are graphite. So you can't bend that. Oh, see, God dang it. Cause your look was fucking spot on. You are a great actor. Cause you look like what the fuck just happened. Yeah, man, I've been in five commercials. So I'm working on my acting career. God, <laughs> no kidding. Did you, uh, did you make your own deal with Rocket Mortgage? When did, they, no. did you have to get an agent, or what, what do they do? They said, "Here's how it is. We're gonna, you get to be in a commercial. And this is what we give you." 
No, Bryson's agent helps me out with that stuff. He's amazing. Oh, right. He's, the, he's the best agent on tour. Well, you'd have to be. All right, Tim. So we're going to get into a little bit other stuff, but I want to hear a couple stories. I want to hear a really your best Ryder Cup story. Best Ryder Cup story. Well, I mean, I've only been in one Ryder Cup. So the only story I have is we were paired with Phil in the afternoon matches the first day in, in France. And I'm sitting there and, and Phil asked me, he goes, Tim, can I do my pens with you? Because we have a special way of triangulating where the pens are off the green books by using the, the uh, sprinkler heads. And so, you know, the hole can, if the hole's off, say that the official paces it on 15 yards and three off the left. Okay. Well, a lot of times it's hard to f a foot to a yard, but when you're talking about using a laser scan green contour book, right, which is which is accurate to like a thousandth of an inch, you need to know exactly where the pin is, especially when you're dealing with crowns and saddles where there's hardly any, you know, slope. And so, because if you're on one side of the crown and the pin was actually on the other, Right, it's a big, you'd go the other way, it'd be a big deal. So we triangulate, we triangulate these pins. Well, you know, we knew where they were at the Ryder Cup because they, we can go out that, you know, that we can go out before the match and do that. So anyway, I'm sitting there with Phil, and Bubba's not playing yet in the, in the morning either. But Phil's sitting there telling me about, he was telling me about, uh, we're just having a conversation, and he's talking about how he has this special energy and that, during his mat one year in the Ryder Cup against Justin Rose, he's like, I focused and harnessed all my energy and put it into his left foot. So he had played horrible. And I ended up beating him and he played poorly. And he also said that, you know, his wife, Amy, she's like his source of energy, you know? And that when he's playing bad, because the, the women, can, the, the spouses can walk inside the ropes, you know, he'll go up and hug her and, and he says that I feel this energy from her. And um, so he goes, Tim, he goes, stand up. And so I stand up. And Phil literally gets like his nose is right here. Like we are basically like an inch apart from each other. And I'm kind of looking over Phil's shoulder, and, and Bubba's like looking at me like, what's going on? You know? <laughs> and he's like, Tim, do you feel it? And I said, well, <laughs> no, but I, I feel, I feel a little weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I don't feel that energy, but you know, that's just Phil, right? He is yeah. an amazing dude. He, man, he's into, here's this guy that's this incredible field player, right? Best mm -hmm. short game in the world, all this stuff, right? Would, pro would be Tiger if it weren't for Tiger, right? Yeah. Uh, of his generation. and But he is so into so many things. He's into, he's super technical in like as far as understanding all the launch characteristics. Man, the way he dials his wedges up, the way he hits these shots, the way he looks at the grass, all these things. And you don't, I didn't expect that. From Phil, right? When I, you know, from what I see on TV or used to see on TV, and this guy, man, is, he's into golf. He is big time into golf, and he is fun to be around. That's phenomenal. Yeah, uh, that's an amazing story. I want to hear your best Tiger Woods story. Okay, so Tiger, you know, I was never a Tiger fan watching TV because I'm an underdogger. You know, and Tiger was the best, greatest ever, always winning, always on the leaderboard. So I was always wanting someone to come up and beat him, right? Which rarely ever happened. And uh, like, remember when Bob May was playing Tiger in the. Yeah. And I was like, that was like the greatest nine holes of golf I'd ever seen. It was like, thought Bob May would take down Tiger Woods. That would have been so cool. But um, 
anyhow, so, you know, when I first met Tiger, we, anytime Tiger was in the field, we'd play nine holes with Tiger in, in the practice round. And, you know, I'm thinking, what am I going to say to Tiger Woods that is interesting or doesn't sound like I'm kissing his ass? And I said, <laughs> I'm not going to say anything. And so we played the whole round and he shook my hand at the end. And that was that, you know, nothing, just normal stuff. And so anyway, a couple weeks later, we're playing again. And I forget what it was, but he, he was talking about the break of this putt. And I'd said something sarcastic and he laughed, you know, and then from then on, he'd kind of bust my chops anytime he could. Right. And just little funny stuff here and there, just because he has a sarcastic sense of humor. Right. And so do I. So anyway, we kept it pretty simple. But um, one year at the uh, we're at the Players Championship, and again we're playing on the Wednesday, and I'm Bryson's in his rookie orientation meeting, and Tiger's on the range, and we're set up next to Tiger. Well, I realize you know I have to hit the shot on 17. They have a caddy competition on the 17th hole of the Players. The island green and so i'm like man i better hit a couple shots next time i haven't hit any shots <laughs> so i pull out bryson's clubs and i'm hitting a couple shots and you know i'm hitting them pretty good and then all of a sudden i just just shank one man hauls a rocket almost into the teaching center there on the right and i look i look over my shoulder kind of see who's you know if anybody's looking who saw it leaning on his club and he's laughing right and i'm like okay whatever so anyway, we go play and we get to 17 and the players all hit. Tiger, Tiger hit it to like, I don't know, 30 feet. Bryson hit it to like 30 feet. And uh, so now it's the caddies turns to hit turn to hit. We're playing with Harold Barner too. So Joe LaCava hits in the water. Um, Varner's caddy hits it in the water. And so then I'm the only hope. I hit it up there and I hit it like 23 feet just onto the back fringe. And uh, so anyway, no big deal. We had a bet with Bryce and he had to carry the bag up, which he did. Nice. So sorry for the long story, but anyway, in the, in the, so now Thursday comes around, we're playing 16. Bryson hits a great drive. hits like a four iron on onto the green on 16. And so we're walking up and I said, Hey, Bryson, if your life depended on it and you had to hit the 17th green, would you rather have Tiger or me hit the shot? <laughs> he's like, he goes, Tiger. He said, F and Tiger, right? And I'm like, what do you mean, man? I said, I'm 100%. And in Bryson fashion, he says, that's not enough. That's not a big enough sample size. <laughs> so, anyhow, uh, fast forward a year. Again, playing with Tiger. Um, or no, sorry, we didn't play with Tiger. We we were we didn't play the back nine on Wednesday when the caddy competition happens. We're on the ninth hole, and Bryson goes, "Dude, let's run over. Have you hit the shot again?" Right. So I hit run over, grab an eight iron, chip it up there, hit it to nine feet. I finished third in the competition that year. So again, next day we're playing Thursday. And he pounds his drive down there, hits like a five iron in the middle of the green. We're walking up, and I'm like, Bryson, if your life depended on it, he's like, fuck <laughs> you, Tiger. <laughs> uh, oh, like, that's oh. awesome. So I that's get, the Tiger story. Yeah, but anyway, I get the first day I hit it on the green, you know, Tiger doesn't say anything. I walk up. Bryson wanted me to cut it out, so I do. And as we're walking off the green, t Tiger taps me on the ass and says, great shot, Timmy. So, that uh, yeah, nice. very nice. That's amazing. I love those kind of stories. I I'm a too. huge Tiger Woods fan. I always have been. He was, uh, he's just a few months older than I am. Came up through junior golf in Oregon. And I knew who Tiger Woods was back when I was, you know, in high school and stuff. So I knew kind of what was coming. Didn't know the exact extent of it. But uh, I love Tiger Woods. And I really, really, really. I've, I've always told people, like, Tiger Woods is going to be the oldest guy to ever win a major. Tiger Woods is going to break Jack's record. 
and I still firmly believe that even even the condition he's in right now, I'm really hoping and praying that he's going to come back and start. Yeah, Tiger, I'm a massive Tiger Woods fan now, and I will tell you, the coolest thing is that when you finish nine holes playing with Tiger, or when you play with Tiger, he at the end of the round, he comes over, looks you in the eye, gives you a, a you know good handshake, and flashes all those white teeth. You know, God. he's got that big oh, smile, yeah. and he makes you feel like the most important person. And it is damn cool it's for the greatest golfer to ever walk to to know your name and and treat you that way. You know, because you wouldn't think he would. Be, you know, all the people he interacts with, they just feel like, man, I gotta go. You know, he's he makes it so personalized, and it's amazing. That's an amazing story. I, I love the fact that 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 you can say that because I think that solidifies my my. Uh, feelings for tiger but uh yeah. he is so, funny, he and he's funny as hell he's a great dude he's a fucking terrible fucking driver jesus stop <laughs> Get, stop driving. yeah, yeah we kind of joke it. like hey we kind of joke like hey tiger if you seriously if you need a driver i mean just jesus. call one of us up we'll drive for yeah. you gosh no doubt speaking of drivers good segue well let's uh let's talk the loop because uh, I your your website went live recently. I checked it out last night. <laughs> Glasses look badass. You need more pictures on your website, by the way. I want to see the inside more. Yeah, and well, it, there are. We're changing that. If you look, if you look at that picture that says loop on it, there is a little picture icon that you click on, but you can't see it because it's white up there in the lights. We're working on that. But we will. okay. And and it might have been different. I didn't pull it up on my computer. I just looked it on my phone. So it might be a little bit different if I look on a de desktop or something. Yeah. So, so so tell everybody we, we know we know what it is, but you tell everybody what it is. Yeah. So if for everybody in the Northwest it's been to abandoned dunes, you know, it's not the easiest drive, that's for sure. And anybody in the country that's trying to get out there, you know, they they don't know where to rent cars or, you know, it's so difficult to fly into Bandon and, you know, being there caddy in all these years and going, man, I, oh, you know, a friend of mine, Amos Baker, he's another caddy and he's a partner with me in this. He, um, he and I, you know, used to ride into work to go carry our bags and go, man, there's got to be a better way to make money. And we've always thought about doing this, but just never had the capital and, you know, caddying for the number five player in the world, you know, great luxury to make some good money so we could do this and um what we've done is we built a most most guys or a lot of groups that come out to band are, are eight guys two foursomes and so what we did we built a 36 foot bus with eight captain's chairs that are heated cooled massage they have six-way power there's a full bar full bathroom with sink and the suspension in it is as nice as you can get you know, we paid an extra $15,000 for the best suspension you could have. It has full surround sound, two TVs. It is amazing. It is so damn cool. And it has all the, you know, the lighting in it. Um, you know, it has shades that come down or up. Man, it is, it is delicious. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so anyway, we wanted to create this. And he was thinking, dude, what are we going to do in the winter? You know, because, you know, people from the northwest playing us well people from the northwest need to have us come pick them up at waverly or portland golf club or you or at our club. house what's that or at our house <laughs> or their house whatever we'll pick you up and take you and and so the trip man everything's included on the bus you get on we take you we drop you off we pick you up and bring you home you everybody you guys have played band and you know how tired you are after playing. Oh my god. The last god. thing you want to do is get in your car and drive five hours back to Portland. Yeah, and Todd and, makes me drive every time. And yeah, he, and the, well, he, the worst part is is yeah, the guys want to drink in the back. Now the driver's <laughs> on the hook for open container or deep. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. And it's not and not confirm nor deny. Yeah. So what we want to do, you know, for the for the guys that fly in from other states. We wanted their trip to start the moment they landed, not the moment that they landed, got their rental car, drove five hours to Bandon, had to stop and guys, so guys could go to the bathroom five times on the trip because they're drinking. You know, we pick you up, it's going to be four and a half hours to Bandon, you know, and you're going to ride in luxury. You're going to 
be able to sit across from your best friends, your golfing buddies and talk about, you know, all that, how you played and, and, you know, shoot the shit like you do in the bar. And that's exactly what we've created. And it is, it's phenomenal. And we're excited about it. So what we're, our, our biggest hope is that, you know, we're going to try and do something with the Oregon chapter PGA, uh, get out and sponsor a tournament where we can, um, or sponsor a hole where guys can come in and get on the bus and, um, you know, one of the primes where the member or the, the amateurs can get on there, the pros can get on there, grab a beer, look at it real quick, because it is, it is the definition of luxury. And our tagline is civilized golf travel. I mean, it's it is a civilized way to get to Bandon. And it, I think it's the only way. Yeah, it's, and I heard you talk recently that when you drive into Bandon, everything changes. It's, it is the most magical, and I've been there probably eight times. Every time I just cross the, the road into that sign and you start driving that up there, you just get goosebumps. I'm getting goosebumps talking about it. Oh, my God, that's the best place on earth. And if, if you have this luxury bus that suddenly takes you, and then you don't even have a care in the world about coming home, it's, it, it's, it's a genius idea, and I, I can't wait to use it. We're going down in December, Tim, and and uh, I mean, I don't know if you have like uh, cheat codes or coupon codes or what, but I mean, I might start just saving money right now. And and one of my follow up questions is going to be how does how do people from Portland use it? Because I know it, it's kind of set up to pick people up from the airports, but sounds like if we want to set it up, you might just pick stuff from our home. Yeah, we pick you up from just a, we meet you guys anywhere and pick you up. You know, I'd say the best place to be is your golf club because you can park there. Oh, and yeah. They can meet up there and we can swing up to, it doesn't matter, Heron Lakes or East Moreland, doesn't matter. We'll, we'll pick you up wherever you want to be. But, um, you know, the nice thing, too, is that, um, you know, you, once you're on band and you don't need a car, right? Yeah. The shuttle services are great. I had a group that just called me. They're like, hey. Would you pick us? We're flying into Eugene. Can you give us the round trip? And we're like, absolutely. And they say, well, would you pull over so we can, you know, go to the, get some, you know, food for the room, you know, some snack stuff and grab some beer and, and whiskey and stuff like that. So absolutely. Our driver will take you to say, you know, to, to a store, help you get what you need, you know, um, so you don't need to be off property and you can, you can also pick stuff up if you need to. We have plenty of storage in the bus. So, uh, you know, everything, all the luxuries are there. You just have the one bus, Tim? I have one there now. I'm actually driving. I've had it made in Erie, Pennsylvania. It is, um, I found this company and love their work. And so, we ordered another one. I'm picking it up in about two weeks. I'm going to play golf along the, on the way back. We're going to play Muirfield Village. We're going to play Bell Reef Country Club. We're going to St. play Louis. Valley Hill in Colorado. And then we're going to play to be determined in Salt Lake City. And then I'm going to play in Bend and then finish up at Bend. Do you, uh, do you by chance need a couple people to accompany you on this trip from Pennsylvania? <laughs> Man, maybe it works. Maybe maybe work some kinks out in that bus. I mean, I'm off for a couple well, of weeks. I mean, I, I, I'd have no problem driving I, from Pennsylvania back I and mean, we take turns, but if <laughs> I was wondering if we should, we should pin Tim down for the pro-am and band in next yeah. April, you know, me, you, Pisha, Hart, and we'll get four other, other dudes. What do you think? You want to go to a pro-am and band in April next year? Yeah, I'd love to. Let's do it. It's on the books. It's we're, write it down, Todd. I got it. We just got what it. What I will tell you is that we've had people book so far. I had a guy the other day book for February of 2023. Love so it. We're taking reservations. We're actually been surprised. I did, you know, these. I did another podcast. We have an article coming out in golf.com. Um, this stuff's really been driving traffic to our, our website and it's easy it's like booking an airplane you can just you don't have to talk to anybody you can book it or you can call either way but it's super easy to book um you pay half your trip in advance and then you pay the the, the second half of it 30 days prior to your trip and it's, uh, so. it sounds like you're going to need some more buses tim 
man, the, everything is people, you know, if you've been to a car lot lately, there are not many cars on them. And the yeah. chips, you know, that's the biggest problem is getting the chips for the vehicles. And the same with, we have, it's an F550 36 foot bus. Um, everything in the back of it has been, was customized and made at this, this place in, in Pennsylvania. And, uh, but yeah, I have, I have, so I have two, I will have two in band and by the, you know, the 25th of August, and then I have two more. One will be done in February. One will be done April 1st. So, um, you know, we're going to keep pumping them out as long as we can fill them up. And I do think that, you know, our winter with all the groups from the Northwest, I think that it's a no brainer, man. I think we'll be booked up. And we're I got I got to I got to tell you, Tim. Todd and I and a few and several other firefighters have been going down in December every year. Last last couple of years, we've been playing in shorts and short sleeves, but we don't want that to be known across the entire world. But December is the time to go, and it is actually getting super hard to book. Uh, we, Todd and I booked a trip a few years ago. I think just the two of us went down, joined up with this group in December. And we booked our stuff maybe two weeks in advance, but now it's like, if you're not a year out, you're, you're done. You can't, you, yeah. unless you got to wait for cancellations. So I think this yeah. is going to be a big deal for people in the Pacific Northwest as well. And, and we will be more than happy to give, give your business a shout out on our podcast anytime and every time we, we speak, because this is a big deal. It's super fun. I think we might give it a shot in December. At least I want to look into it. Yep. And, and again, if you have any coupon codes, let us know. <laughs> right on. Just, I would tell you book quickly because I mean, I was shocked that I didn't, you know, people booked so far in advance. I thought, you know, you know, when I book travel, I'll usually go two to three weeks in advance. Right. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, like I said, I just had something for 2023. We've had stuff in May and April of next year already. Um, so people are booking it and, you know, I'm I'm really really excited about it. I think, you know, wh why should your trip not start the moment you get your guy your group together? You know, it, it yeah. is fun to sit with your buddies. We sat on that bus. I had a bunch of caddies look at it. We sat outside a bar in in, uh, in Coos Bay, and we sat on that thing and listened to music. And you know, there were eight of us in there drinking beer, shooting the shit for. We were out, literally in there for three hours. Oh, it was like amazing. Didn't even realize yeah. it was so fun. So, so uh, I think you know when you get on the bus, I think you need to say something like "Welcome to the Loop Transportation." This is going to be your epic trip to Bandit. And then maybe about halfway through the trip, Todd and I can come on and say some sort of message like, "Now you're passing through Eugene or something." You know, I, I, I don't know. What do you think? You know, man, this is a, we I, the caddies at Bandon love to go play golf. We used to play all over Oregon, and we'd get like you know eight, twelve guys go on these trips. Well, we used to always stop in Scottsburg. There, you know, when you cross the bridge going over the Umpqua River, you know, there's that little park on the right. We used to go down there, and there was a big, like uh, diamond shaped sign. We'd all go to the bathroom, and we'd all pull our drivers out and hit balls at that sign. You know, oh, hell yeah. and hit that sign, and like that thing had so many dents in it. Well, when I was driving the bus, I pulled the bus down there, and I the sign was gone. I was pissed. That was kind of like a rite of passage for Dang me. It. I was I was planning on, you know, having my group stop there and pound balls into the sign because we had all so, just all laughing. It's so so I think I think you just I think you just actually uh, gave me gave me an idea. We are going to Todd and I will get a divot room sign made. Yeah, and we'll put it up across the river, and you guys can get balls at the divot room sign. How does that sound? I love it. <laughs> awesome. All right, uh, let's just uh, wrap it up really quick. Um, we're gonna just have a few final questions. Um, Tim Tucker's drink of choice: TX whiskey. Okay, rank your favorite. Rank your golf courses abandoned in order of top to least favorite. And I know that they're like children. You can't rank them all. Bandon Dunes, Bandon Trails, mm. Pacific Dunes, Sheep Ranch, Old McDonald. Oh, gosh. That's like my, it's like my order. What do you eat after day, Caddy? Steak. Steak and potatoes. 
Nice. nice. All right. One final question. And I think I know the answer. Thumbs up or thumbs down. Patrick Reed. Ooh, nice. There it is. Thumbs right, up, Tim. everybody. Tim, this has been amazing. Why don't you stay <laughs> on the line? We finish up this uh, meeting. Uh, and thank you so much, Tim. This has been phenomenal. Yeah, you're the greatest. Appreciate, appreciate it. it. Yeah, I was happy to do it, man. I appreciate it. Thank you so much.